Thank you for joining our broadcast today. We want you to be free to hear from God, and we pray that His blessing would be on your life. We're a church that's on mission across the aisle, across the street, and around the world. And we believe the gospel changes everything. God bless. Sing it. praise you for who you are. Lord, you are our Father, you are Creator, you are Healer, and you are Sustainer. And as we are gathered here in this place today, Lord, we just humbly ask you to come and meet us here. And Lord, may our worship be pure, Lord, as we go before you this day. And we ask all of this in your precious Holy Son's name. Amen. Amen. Sing this out with us. You hear me when I call, you are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Who shall I be? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever. is always by my side. 
is worthy. Amen. Church ain't always easy, especially when the saints just want to run wild. Whoever said the church was for perfect people must have been a few sandwiches short of a picnic. Because Sunday after Sunday, let me tell you, we see all kinds. Short and tall, young and old, nerds, hipsters, city slickers, and rednecks. Folks who've been blessed and others who've been struggling. All shapes, all sizes, and definitely all facial hairs. Each with their own stories. We are what we are. What you see is what you get. We're happy to meet you wherever you're at. Because that's exactly where God meets us. In our sweat, in our tears, in our doubts, in our mess. We ain't perfect. We don't expect you to be neither. Because God uses all kinds, loves all kinds, and redeems all kinds. Not to build us a dynasty, but to build up his kingdom. Shoot, he even accepts the crazy uncles. Hey, let her rip, fellowship. Welcome to our church. Now, I get blamed for a lot of stuff, but I am not responsible for that one. Do you know, is it Butch? Okay, it's Butch, and he's doing the TV. No, uh, thank you very much. God bless <laughs> I may even go play the congas over there a little bit during that one. But anyway, we're glad you're here. Uh, we have uh, about 80 students and leaders that are at Cabin Madness, and I guarantee you it's mad at that cabin right now. So uh, I, the teenagers that usually sit here, I, I'm going to have to aim to be able to hit my spit at least this direction today. So there's a few of them that are here. So we're pray for our teenagers. They're, uh, they're at Cabin Madness, be coming home this afternoon. Pray for the leaders. They probably didn't sleep, but they have to function as adults on Monday. And so pray for them, but just pray that God would use them in a special way. I'm supposed to do announcements from up here. But uh, look on your program. I, I actually left, I've misplaced mine somewhere, but I think I know what's in there. On the back, we have community groups that have started. And that's basically a little bit of what the video is talking about. You can bring your mess, your stuff, uh, community sharing life. We're all different. So those community groups have been formed. Um, and uh, if you're in a Sunday school class, that, that's a community group. That's a fellowship of people. Uh, a fellowship is not two fellas in a ship. It's when you share life together. And so uh, think about that. Pray about the community groups, the opportunities that you have, Sunday school. Um, on the front of the bulletin, I have a class that I'm going to start next week, a one-week class around Alcoa in 60 minutes. I can do it, and you can do it if you get there at 9 o'clock. If you're, in a, if you're in a Sunday school class, you can come out for one week if you want to know what our vision and our mission is. I'm going to share that with you. I'm going to talk about going, growing, and yes, giving, stewardship. Uh, I talk about what the Bible talks about, so we're not ashamed of that. We want you to give. We want you to give joyfully and cheerfully here. Uh, so take an opportunity to look inside the bulletin. There's, a, there's something for everyone. We have a family ministry here, so we're really glad that you're here. And uh, if you're a guest today, we appreciate you coming, and we want you to feel welcome. So we're going to have a time of just fellowship together here where we shake hands together. So I'm going to ask all of you to stand, if you will. And uh, if you're sick, just use the elbows. If not, you can shake hands, but we're glad you're here. Take an opportunity.
Lift this up as your prayer. A thousand years will be as one. A thousand years will be as one when face to face I see the splendid
believe that, you agree with that, say amen. 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 Lord God, we come before you today. We thank you for this promise that you've given us. Lord, this hope, this peace, this grace. Lord, thank you for that. We owe all we are to you. We owe everything to you, dear God. We want to give that to you this morning. Lord, through our, through our, our songs, through our prayers, through our scripture, Lord, through our tithes and our offerings. And Lord God, as we take this offering up this morning, let us give our tithes to you. But Lord, let us give up and above that. Lord, let us be a sacrificial giver. Lord, as we take these tithes and offerings, Lord, let us give as a cheerful giver. Not begrudgingly, Lord. Not out of what we have, but Lord, up and above everything that we have, Lord. Through faith. Lord, give us that faith and help us to give sacrificially to you this morning. Lord, it is our privilege to do this and give back to you just a portion of what all that you have given to us. Lord, bless this and uh, bless us as we uh, edify you and lift you up in songs of praise. And in Jesus' name we pray this, Lord. Amen and amen. And you may be seated. Prepare our hearts, O oh God, help us to receive, break the heart and stony ground, help our unbelief, plant your Guards of the roots 
That song is what Paul's been saying for one chapter in 1 Thessalonians. We've had four messages on the unstoppable church. And here's what Paul's been saying. Show us Christ. He's been showing Christ his death, burial, and resurrection. He preached it in the synagogue to the Jews and to those who would listen. And then there was conversions that took place because he was not preaching a gospel of prosperity. He was preaching a gospel of truth. And so we understand that God's word is true. And so that song, when, when I hear the words, reveal your glory through the preaching of your word, I think, Lord, what does that mean? And here's what it means. When you take the message of the word and you begin to not just listen to it, you learn it and you live it. You can always know when you're applying God's Word in your life, when you live it. It's not listened to, it's lived and learned and applied by the truth of God's Word. So when you go home, you can think about, am I living what we sang about? Am I living what we're teaching about? That's the important thing. So what a beautiful text for us to lead into after that song. In chapter 2, we've made it to chapter 2. And I hope that you don't leave chapter 1 too quickly because Paul's been talking about the unstoppable church. And then in chapter 2, the handle that you'll have in your heart and mind is the uncontainable church. The uncontainable church. He's going to go back and tell us why he's doing what he's doing. And I can tell you this, after 30 years of ministry, 30 years of ministry, my heartbeat has always been, show us Christ. I don't want you to see me. I don't want you to see a church. I don't want you to see people. I want you to see Christ. Because when you see Christ and he reveals his glory through the preaching of your word, the light comes on on the inside and you're forever going to be changed. So it's not something that we do. It's something that we are. And Paul is going to talk about effective gospel delivery. He's going to talk about today, and I want you to hear this carefully. He's going to talk about ministers. He's going to talk about himself, Silas, and Timothy, and, uh, and Silvanus, and he's going to talk about their ministry. He's going to talk about them as ministers of the Gospels, as models of the Word of God. And where, where we can translate this today is, and I sent this on my update if you get it midweek, is we're all ministers of God. Everybody in here is a minister. If, you've, if Christ has revealed himself to you, then you are a minister. You're a gospel minister. So you wouldn't come today and say, well, I'm going to listen to you, and then I'm going to look at your life, and I'm going to put you up and say, well, let me see if you've got all that. You're going to put it all on me. Well, I'm going to turn around and put it back on you because we're all ministers, okay? We're all ministers. And so what we want to see is, if we're all ministers, then how do we minister? What, is the, what does it look like to be a minister if we're all ministers? And so Paul's going to tell us how an effective gospel gets delivered through the ministers. And uh, you might say, but Freeman, you're a paid minister. And, and, some, <laughs> and you might say, I'm not paid. Well, then you can be good for nothing. No, I didn't say that. Just making sure you're awake. The students, they would get that if they were here. I know they would. But, but see, we're all ministers. And Paul's even going to make reference to the fact that he's a, a paid minister. And it's going to talk about the references that. We'll get to that at the end of the chapter. And, you, and ministers uh, should be paid. The Bible talks about that. Paul talks about double honor. Uh, he said you ought to respect those who are ministers of God, number one. So if you don't respect the ministers of God, then you should repent. 
And if you don't think ministers should be paid, you should also repent. Because Paul talks about both of those, 1 Timothy 5, 1 Corinthians 9. But his whole point is that he is using the gospel to forward the kingdom. And so that's what he's talking about. So the uncontainable church in chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. So I'll ask you to stand out of honor and respect of God's Word. And uh, think about what it is that the Lord wants to do in your life today. And, and just say yes as we read the text. Here's what the text says, and there's some connecting words here, the words for. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For, another connecting word, for our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit, but... As we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. Nor did we seek the glory of men, from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. Father, we take your word seriously today, as we do any Sunday. In the balance of life and death are people's lives that are hanging right now. People that are hanging in the balance of eternity, heaven and hell, making choices with their own decisions, how they're going to live their life and where they're going to spend eternity. And Paul had no time to play games and no time to be religious. So my prayer is that we won't get caught up in that playing games and being religious, but we'll see the text for what it is. That we'll jump off the diving board today and we'll swim in this text and we won't even touch bottom, but the more that we swim in it, the more that we'll see what a model minister is, what ministers should look like. And we want our ministers at this church, which is all of us, to look like ministers of the gospel. And so, Father, I pray that as we, as we learn together, as we grow together, that we will take heed to your word, and through the preaching of your word, as the song says, that your glory would be revealed. And so we should not fear man. Uh, we, we don't fear man today. We fear God. We stand in awe, as the song says, of God and who he is. And so we just bow before you, Lord. We pray that you will take this effective gospel delivery, and you will help us to be good bread men. You'll help us to be good delivery people. You'll help us to deliver in a way that would be honorable to you. And every one of us are going to be able to take our lives today and set them against the grid of Scripture and see how we measure up to a minister of the gospel. Because Paul says, this is what makes a difference. So, Father, we see all kinds of ministers on TV. We see some on Larry King who can't even articulate what sin is. And people in the world say, well, there's a minister because he's famous. Famous people aren't ministers. Faithful people are ministers. So God help us if we don't take heed to this call today and we don't learn from your word and we don't bow before the one who gives us the power and the strength. Show us Christ today. In your name we pray. Amen. Paul talks about ministers. Ministers. What are ministers? What does it look like? Who are they? What do they do? Well, here's what he says. He talks about the three. Here's what he says. Coming right out of chapter 1, uh, out of talking about idols that we talked about last week. So hopefully you've had some uh, burning of CDs and tapes and different things. You've had to let go of some things because idols can be anything we talked about last week. And so here's what Paul says in his conduct. Here's what he says. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. Now, what he was saying to them is when we came to you, he's talking to the church at Thessalonica, when we came to you, that our coming to you was not in vain. The word vain means to be empty-handed. Um, it means to be empty of any kind of truth or void of any kind of truth. And so it would be like at Easter when you were a kid and you, went, you, you, you bit into that chocolate bunny and you thought it was all full of chocolate and guess what? It was what? It was empty. It was empty. Paul is saying to the church at Thessalonica, 
I did not come to you with any agenda other than the agenda of Christ. I didn't come to uh, make me famous. I didn't come to get any accolades from man. I came out of a pure motive and a pure heart. You can always tell a minister by the purity of their motive in their heart. There are a lot of ministers, and I'm going to say it because we are on TV. There are a lot of ministers on TV who want money from you. And their whole motive and their whole goal is coming to you in vain. Because they're coming to you in a way that they want you to give something so they can get what they want. And Paul said, be shameful on that because my gospel, the gospel that we preach of Jesus Christ, Him crucified, I want you to know that the, we came to you and it's not in vain. It's not without purpose. It's not without effect. With effect it's not empty-handed. I, I think I've told this story, but one time uh, I went to the... Vols game with several of the men in the church here, basketball game, and I, I had gotten a free ticket, and I was so excited about that. Somebody had season tickets, and I went to the game, and I was so proud of myself. I pulled out my wallet, and I was going to buy us uh, what are they, Frito Pies, what do they call? Petros, thank you. Petros, I was going to buy everybody. To, hey, drinks on the house, Petros on the house. Here, I step up, and I say, you order, you order, and I'm just stepping back, stepping like this, and I went to pay, and they didn't take credit. So I had, to, I had to back crawfish. I crawfished, and I said, okay, you guys pay for your own. And I was like, you know, so I came, I, I thought I had money, but I really came empty-handed, and that's what Paul's saying. So I want you to understand something here, that Paul's making it very clear that he came with the purpose of preaching the gospel. So you see the word for. You look in the text, and the word for is a little word, but it connects the word but. The word but is going to back into what he just said in the word for. For you know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But, here it is, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God. So he talks about when the gospel came to them, it was not empty-handed, and he suffered spitefully at Philippi. You remember what happened at Philippi? They took Paul and his friends, and they stripped them, and they beat them, physically abused them, verbally abused them, took them into the marketplace. And don't think like, well, the fresh market or Whole Foods? No. They took him into the marketplace, and they stripped him to make a public demonstration of his life and the other's lives, and they stripped them naked, and they beat them to a pulp, and they put them into prison. So that's how the gospel came to Philippi. You see, suffering produces boldness. That's what the text says. We were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, and we were bold in our God. The reason that I'm not bold and you're not bold is because we don't know what suffering is. See, suffering produces boldness. And here's what will happen. The gospel will be met with a conversion. Some people will be converted or it will be met with conflict. It will be met with conversion, or it will be met with conflict. So Paul is talking about, listen, when the gospel came to you, I had been run out of the city. Paul could cause a riot on a good day. He just caused riots everywhere that he went. He walked into Philippi, caused a riot. You remember because they had cast out a demon, uh, 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 they cast out demons out of a lady who was a, a seller of purple and working for an owner, and the owner got mad, and as soon as they cast out the demon, they were uh, put in chains and stocks and put in the prison, and then the earth earthquake happened in Philippi, you remember? There was a riot, then the earthquake happened, and the Philippian jailer's like, oh, they're getting out, they're getting out. And Paul and Silas said, hey, no, no, we're right here. We're right here. And what happened is Paul preached the gospel in Philippi. He preached the gospel in prison, and a Philippian jailer saw Christ. Show us Christ. They saw Christ in Paul and Silas in jail, because what would happen when the jail doors break? You run. And Paul and Silas, they didn't run because they didn't fear anything. Whom shall I fear? He's gone before me. And so they didn't fear anything, but they were spitefully treated in Philippi. And so when Paul says we were spitefully treated in Philippi, what he's saying is we could have quit. We could have stopped. Let me ask you a question. When you suffer, when you go through hard times, would you be known as a quitter? I know a lot of people who are quitters. Quitters never win and winners never quit. I know a lot of quitters. 
I know a lot of people that something can derail them. They'll quit over. They get their feelings hurt or somebody didn't call them or whatever the situation. is. Well, look at Paul. Man, this guy's getting beat for his very life. And he says, hey, listen, we just used our suffering in order to be bold. And what happened is we slid 100 miles from Thessalonica, excuse me, from Philippi to Thessalonica. And then we caused another riot. Because remember the story? You remember he, they were bringing the gospel? And, uh, and Jason got thrown into jail. And Paul and Silas, they had to scoot out of the city in Thessalonica. And then they had to go back and check on this little fledgling church. That's where we are. So when Paul talks about being treated spitefully, he's talking about physically. He's talking about spiritually. He's talking about emotional, emotional breakdown. I mean, you know, if anybody could quit, if anybody could throw in the towel, I could. Here's the point. We are not responsible for people's response to the gospel, but we are responsible for for being faithful to the gospel. I want to say it again. We are not responsible for people's response to the gospel. Look at their response. We are responsible for being faithful to the gospel. Because listen to me, the gospel is the only message we have. It's the only message that we have, church. It is the only message that we have. It's not, your, it's not the method we have. It's the only message that we have. Cha- you cannot change the content of the gospel. And Paul's saying, hey, we, we suffered, man. And here's what he said. Look at verse 2. We were bold in our God. Can I tell you something? The mark of a minister. They're bold. I didn't say rude. We've been around rude Christians. Well... I, 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 I've just been around them. Uh, bold is different. Bold is energized by the Spirit. The word bold means to speak, speak freely, to speak openly, um, to speak without fear and full confidence in faith in what you're saying. That's what the word boldness means in the original language. So, so the idea was Paul, in the midst of all this suffering, in the midst of all this chaos, He's speaking forth the gospel. It's the only message that he has. And he's speaking it boldly. I want to ask you this week, were you bold in your witness? Saturday, I went to get the mail. And up came a nice-looking Lexus. And a gentleman got out with a nice coat and a tie on. Had a guy strapped in the back seat over here. Had another guy strapped in the back seat over here. And I knew exactly what they were fixing to ask me. They were going to hand me something, and they did but I didn't take it. It was about, are you, do, you, do you know the future? Everybody's concerned today about the future. Hello, red lights, flash, I got it. I know who you are. And all I told them is, I don't worry about my future because I know the one who holds my future. And I'm a blood-bought, born-again believer in Jesus Christ. And I know where I'm going. And he said, you know, one of the raps that we get is people don't think we believe in Jesus and we believe in Jesus. You don't believe that Jesus is the only way. You believe in a Jesus that you've crafted, that you've looked at, that you've, you know, that works. The reason you're coming into my driveway is because you're working your salvation off. I'm not working mine off because grace works for me. I work because I am in his hand. I don't work to try to get to him. I get to him through the shed blood of Jesus. And Paul said, we came to this city and we shared the gospel. Paul didn't go, you know what? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? No, he went in with boldness. He went in and said, Jesus, he went into the synagogue for three weeks, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, we've already looked at, and he preached the gospel. He preached the gospel. Oh, it it just grates me. It should you. It should burden you. It should break your heart. It should make you bow. But when you see famous, what we call famous preachers on TV, Larry King gets them. And we got one pastor in Houston who can't articulate what sin is. Well, that's just not my message. Let me tell you what, it's every message of every minister of God, we talk about sin. You understand me? If you are not a minister, you are not a minister if you can't talk about sin. If you can't talk about how to articulate the death, burial, and resurrection, then you have to understand, what is your motive? And they're they're all over TV, they're all over. Send me money or my ministry is going to close down. Whose ministry is it to begin with? If it's God's? And you can take your hands off of it. But if it's yours, you need to get every, you need to squeeze it like a turnip and get people. What I'm trying to tell you is Paul was bold, but man, he was bold for the right things. He didn't fear men, fear man, he feared God. In the 1600s in England, England was going downhill. A couple of preachers emerged out of England. They preached in churches 
maybe like this, probably not, a little, little bit different, a little more formal. But their names were John Wesley and George Whitfield. And in the 1600s, immorality was running rampant in England. In fact, the government had tried to put all these programs into place because there was so much turmoil in England. And uh, uh, what was happening, they would set up gallows. There was like 160 crimes that you would, uh, you would be killed for. And so they set up gallows. And, and they wouldn't let the people import uh, uh, <clears throat> any kind of alcoholic beverage or anything like that. You couldn't import it into the, to the city in, anymore. And so what they had is about every sixth person, every sixth family would have a, a, a gin ministry. A gin ministry. And so, so they, would, they would be getting drunk on gin, and then they would go to the streets in England, and, 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 and they would watch these hangings, and they would watch people, that, hey, yeah, man, just, just kill them, just kill them. They were drunk out of their mind, and two guys emerged in the midst of turmoil and suffering in England, John Wesley and George Whitfield. And they would preach in their churches, in their pulpits, but then they would get out on the streets and they would preach the gospel. And, 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 and they tried to legislate, the government tried to legislate morality, and you can't do that. We, we know that here in the United States. And the Bible, it, it, the Bible doesn't talk about this. History talks about this, that John Wesley and George Whitfield would preach. And one time George, John Wesley was preaching, and they were throwing cats at him. I said it, cats. You know, could you imagine preaching? You're preaching the gospel in the midst of all this immorality, and like, woo, what now? Now, and uh, you know, you're ducking and ducking. And then one time, uh, historians tell us that they threw a brick at John Wesley, and he ducked his head, and the brick hit the guy behind him and killed him. And John Wesley was preaching a sermon, and you know, you know, and a brick comes, he's ducking, guy here dies. He jumps into the, the there was a, uh, the lake right behind him. He jumps into the lake, swims to the other side of the lake, comes up on the side to see if he's got safety, and continues to preach his message. Do you know that's what happened? Early on, that these men of God were preaching and they were spitefully treated and they were doing what God told them to do and they were doing it with boldness. So I wonder if we have really been lulled to sleep in the church of Jesus Christ. You know, we're comfortable. We have comfortable air and seats, but the Bible says that this church, and if we're going to be a church like this church in Thessalonica, we're going to have to be bold in our God and we're going to have to use our suffering as a platform for boldness. You see, the gospel will be met with conversion, number one. Conflict. Some people leave here mad. Some people do on a Sunday. They leave here mad. I don't want this stuff. Some people leave here glad. Some people leave here sad. And some people just leave here. But I can tell you what, at this church, you will always leave here hearing the word of God. doesn't matter who the mouthpiece is. That's what we stand on. And that's where Paul stood. So I want you to see something here that he says we are bold. So here's, here's what you want to be able to think in your mind. That's the kind of ministers we want. That's the kind of ministry we want. That's the kind of church we want. That's what it's going to take in the 21st century for us to be the kind of church that God wants us to be through our suffering. You know, when somebody suffers, when somebody goes through a bad time, a struggle, whatever it is, the message is squeezed out of them. See, when you're on the mountaintop, I know how you love Jesus because I know how I do. But what happens when you get in the valley? That's when suffering produces a boldness and a platform to witness. So Paul says here, look at the text. We were bold in our God, still in verse 2, to speak to you the gospel, the good news of God, the only message we have, in much conflict. So the idea of the word conflict is the word agoni, and where we get our word agony from. It's like two opposing teams. It's like the football teams coming together that we just deflate gate. We saw two teams that didn't like each other talking smack over the Super Bowl. They were in opposition to one another. And Paul is saying, when we came to you, this message that is God's gospel, it came to you in much conflict. It came to you in agony. It came to you in opposition. There was a war. There was a battle going on for your soul. Then he says, look at this, the next connecting word, for. So at the verse one, we've got for. Verse two, we've got but, a connecting word. Verse three, for, another connecting word. Here's what a minister looks like. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. 
Okay, the word exhortation would mean to, it would mean to come alongside. Um, it would mean an urgent call to come alongside someone. So Paul was preaching a message about the urgent call to bring the gospel alongside the Thessalon- Thessalonians. And so it would be like, any of you have AAA? Several of you? Okay, you break down and you make an urgent call and they send a truck. You, you say, come get me. Come get me. Where are you? I'm right here. And they come get you. If you're paid up, they come get you. That's, that's an urgent call. That's a plea. Hey, I'm in trouble. Uh, my four-wheel drive is not working. I think I'm close to this city, but I'm going to exhortation here. So Paul says, for our exhortation, our urgent call, look at this. Here, here's the key to a minister, did not come from error. The word error means, comes from a, an astronomical term, astronomy. There were stargazers. And these stargazers would watch uh, the stars. And if those stars got off course, they would call it. Uh, They would call it when stars got off course. And what Paul was saying is, this message did not come to you in error. This message did not come off course. This message has been true from the foundation of the world. And so I want you to know the mark of a minister is it doesn't come from error. It comes from a message that doesn't go off course. The messenger may go off course sometimes, but the message is never off course. So you want a minister who always points people to the message and the truth of the message. So that's your responsibility. That's my responsibility. And it doesn't come from error. That's what the word error means. And then he says, or uncleanness, impurity. So what would happen in Thessalonica in in the temples would be impurity. There would be prostitutes. There would be all kinds of sexual immorality taking place. All kinds of impurity. And Paul uses a term talking about immorality and sexual immorality. And he says, I want you to know that the message that we have brought to you, it does not come off course. It's on course. It is right on. It's spot on. We're on it. And it comes from someone who lives a clean life. It comes from someone that lives a clean life. Ministers live clean lives. It's not that we're perfect, but we live lives of purity and holiness. There's an old song that says, uh, holiness, holiness. I long for holiness, holiness in me. Holiness is in me, is in you. So we live a message of cleanness. We don't live a life of uncleanness because it, it's impure. And so Paul's talking about this immorality that's taking place. He says the message of the gospel, the message of a minister, the model is they live clean lives. That's what he was saying. I want to ask you a question. Is your life clean? Are you pure today? Are you saying, Lord Jesus, when we sing the song, my sin has been washed white That is purity. That's cleansing. And so, uh, are you a clean vessel? I didn't say, are you perfect? I'm not perfect. But but we ask for cleansing, our heart to be clean, so that we can deliver this message purified, purified. Here it is. And then he says, Norwood is in deceit. That was a fishing term. It was not false. All right? So here's what Paul's saying right right to begin with. He's telling them about the message. He's telling them about effective gospel delivery. And um, he's giving them an opportunity to understand what the truth is. And then he comes to it right here. Look at this. Verse 4. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. But we have been approved by God. Uh, The word approved means to uh, bear up under the test. It means to pass the test. It means there's a test and you have passed this test. That's what the word improved, approved means. So like when you, um, in tough times, I, you, you always see people, and they're still out there now, they say, buy gold, buy gold, buy gold. You'll see people, especially if you go down 411, you know, they'll be swinging signs, got music going, they do this for 11 hours a day, buy gold, buy gold. Let me tell you something. If you bring them gold, they have a test to see if that gold is pure. They have a test. And what Paul is saying is, but we have been approved by God. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say we're trying to gain God's approval. Here's why. We already have God's approval. It's in Jesus Christ. If you've approved of Jesus, you've approved of me because he lives in me. So he says, I'm not trying to gain God's approval, but we have been approved by God. We have the stamp of approval by God. And, And here's what he says here. Here it is. To be entrusted with the gospel to be entrusted with the gospel. Um, And what that means is, the word entrusted means to 
uh, in the New Testament means to believe. Um, Paul is saying, you know, um, we gave our hearts and he gave us the gospel. That's, that's, that's what he means. And I sent this on my update and I think this is so important. We're always talking about, well, we need to give Jesus our all. We just need to give Jesus all of us. Let's flip that around. He's already given us his all, and he says, I've entrusted you with the gospel. I want you to handle this carefully. So we're always putting the emphasis on, well, my faith and my faith and my faith. Well, what about his? His faith now has endorsed me and has approved me and approved you to be one of a messenger of the gospel, and the message doesn't go off course. So not only have we been approved, but we've been entrusted. We handle with care the gospel message. That's what he's saying. Um, my mentor pastor, one day, I was the student minister, so basically at the bottom of my job description was anything deemed necessary by the pastor. And Jeremy has the same thing. Which basically means you can do some grunt work and not have to complain about it. So my pastor, who travels around the country, um, speaking on uh, his, he, d- he does a message in wild game dinners. He's an b- avid hunter, spends three months in Africa uh, every summer for as long as I've known him. And he has a set of a deer head collection, a deer head collection. And several of these deer heads that he has um, are, are major. I mean, like, that mean like, I think in the book, he's got a message called How to Get Your Name in the Book. And he takes the gospel, but he goes and talks to hunters, to rednecks. You know, you know you're a redneck when you look down and you're driving on your truck, in your truck, and you can see the ground. <clears throat> Thank you, Chuck. I'm glad you got that. So, so he entrusted me. One day I called Leslie. He called me in my office. He said, Freeman, i got a problem. I need you to head to Amarillo. I've got to get my deer collection. I have double booked it. I'm speaking at a church over here. And he, had, and we were going, he was going to San Jacinto Baptist Church in Amarillo where Stan Coffey was the pastor. He said, Freeman, I need, I'll pay you. I'll pay. I said, now nah, we're talking. Now nah, we're talking. I was already on the payroll, but this is double honor. And so he said, uh, I need you to uh, take this deer head collection. I need you to leave in the first thing in the morning. If you'll come to my house, we'll get the uh, deer heads off, you know, my mantles and everything. And he put them in a white van, 15 passenger van, took all the seats out. We tied those deer heads out. He handed me cash up front before I ever went to Amarillo. And so I was thinking, man, this is really going to be good. So we drove 11 hours. Leslie went with me. I said, Leslie, what are you doing? Doesn't matter. Let's go. We got some deer heads. I'm thinking, what if I get stopped? What am I going to tell a state trooper in Texas with a cigar uh, with a mouth like this and a dip, a chew over here as big as this? You know, yeah, excuse me, sir, you were doing 95. And may I check the back of your van? Sure, check. What? And I'd be like this. I'd be going to jail. And uh, we got those deer heads there. And I was so careful in driving because he had entrusted me. This was his collection. I took care of him. I arrived at San Jacinto Baptist Church in Amarillo, and we undid all the ties, and we took the deer heads, and we put them in the collection. And then he was all dressed up. I'm sweating, getting the deer heads out, everything, 50-mile-an-hour winds in Amarillo. And uh, he said, okay. He said, as soon as, as soon as I speak, I want you to come back. We're going to load them back up, and you and Leslie can head home. I was doing an ordination service at our church, which he's the pastor, on Sunday night. We had a 12-hour drive from Amarillo all back home, but we made it, drove all through the night. Uh, didn't even know what coffee was. We were too young for that. We made it all the way back home. I slept till 5 o'clock, got up, did the ordination service. And you know what he did as the pastor? He flew in and out of Amarillo. You follow me? (laughs) That's what he did. He entrusted me with his deer head collection. He said, take care of this. When you go to the hotel, lock it up, cover it up, cover the deer heads up with blank. Whatever you have to do, don't let people see what's in there. He entrusted me with with the deer heads. And Paul says here, look at the text. We ministers have been entrusted with the gospel even so we speak. Why do we speak? Because we've been entrusted with the gospel and we've been approved by God. That's why we speak. So this is a beautiful thing. And here's what he said. Look at the text. I'm going a little further here. We're coming home. Not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. So, so the idea is that we, we are not doing this to please men. I I say this with all humility and honesty and forthrightness to you. 
I don't care what you say to me after the message today. If you tell me that that was the biggest train wreck you have ever preached, you know what I'll say to you? Nothing. I'll just say, I have been entrusted with the gospel, and I am not doing it to make you feel good. I am not doing it to make you tell me, oh, that was a really great sermon, or Nathan doesn't lead worship, or Tracy sing to say, oh, you sing so pretty, or that was great music. We do it because we've been entrusted with the gospel, and the gospel has been entrusted to us, and so we speak unashamedly, openly with forthrightness and truth. It's the truth of the gospel. This is not a set of laws. This is life. And that's what Paul's saying. So I want to say to you, you want ministers like that in your church. And you're a minister. You're a minister. So we speak. Not rude, but we speak with boldness. That's what Paul's saying. And then he says, and I want you to catch these words here, verse 5, for neither at that, neither at any time did we use flattering words. Do you know what the word flat, flattering words means in the Greek? It means that I would tell you what you want to hear so you can respond back to me and give me something. I've been in churches where preachers have acted like they're the poorest things in America. Well, I tell you what, oh, God I just don't have any money and my son needs a bicycle. So, Father, I just pray today and, and then somebody comes up and gives them money for a bicycle. God help us. God help us. Listen, celebrate God's goodness in your life. You know what Paul's saying here? He said, I didn't use the platform of preaching for any other agenda. I didn't use it for myself. I didn't use it to pump me up. I used it to put him on display, and that's what I did. He said, I didn't use any flattery words, and I'm telling you, there's a lot of flapping and flattery stuff on television. You better know your Bible today. You better know it. In the last days, there will be people who are deceitful. And it says that, talks about it in 2 Timothy. So there's false teachers everywhere, and they're coming out of the woodwork, so you can always tell <clears throat> when they use flattery words. So Paul says, look at this, I didn't come to you with flattery words. As you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. The word cloak for covetous means to cover something. Paul says, let me tell you what covetousness is. <clears throat> it's having enough and enough and enough, and more than enough, and then asking for more when you already have enough. That's what covetousness is. And Paul says, listen, I didn't come to you in that way. Because that's the way a lot of ministers come to today. And there's no question about it that the Bible says that we should be given double honor. There's no question that the Bible says ministers should be uh, respected by uh, people. There's no question today in 1 Corinthians 9 that ministers should be paid. But Paul was saying to this group that, listen, I didn't come to you in that way. That's, that's not why I came. I came with a pure heart, and I came with a pure motive, and I came to glorify God. And here's what he says. Look at the text. God is my witness. God's my witness. God is my witness. This is why I came. This is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. My heart and my motive is pure. And I want to ask us in this church, is our heart and our motive pure for being messengers of the only gospel that can change people's lives? Do we have a pure motive or do we have a cloak for covetousness? Are we covering one thing to reveal another? And Paul says, you can never pin that on me. You cannot pin that on me. My heart is pure and my motive motive is right because it's about the gospel and I've been approved and entrusted and I'm carrying these dear heads all the way to Amarillo and back and I'm going to deliver the gospel safely. Now I'm closing with this. Here we go. And I know some of you say, well, he's closing. That means three, at least three. I'm closing with this thought and an illustration. Nor did we seek. Now this is important because you need to see if we're as ministers in here, this is the kind of people you want. Nor did we seek glory from man, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. You know what the word demands mean? It means to put a burden on somebody. Paul says, I didn't come here to put a burden on you. You know, we hear this a lot, and I want you to listen to me carefully. Some of your moms and dads have said to you in their later years, Son, daughter, I don't want to put a burden on you. I don't want to be a burden to you. I don't want to be a burden to society. Can I tell you something? I plan on telling my son, I plan to be a burden. <laughs> 
I, I plan for you to fund my retirement, son. <laughs> I, I plan to be a burden. You know, I, don't, I just don't want to be a burden. Well, Paul's saying, hey, I don't want to be a burden on you. But, but when you think about it, what, his burden wasn't, wasn't money. He, if he needed to go raise money, he could do it. He, he'd go do another job. He's going to preach the gospel. It didn't matter. But, but the whole idea was they thought that there was ulterior motives ulterior motives here, that Paul's in this for himself, or he's in it for his money, or these three guys, they're just trying to get a show, and they're trying to entertain, and, and, they, and they're really coming empty-handed. They don't really have anything in their hand that they can give us. And Paul just knocks it out of the park, and he says, listen, we don't seek the glory of man. Should you ever seek the glory of man? Absolutely not. Those of us that are ministers of the gospel, we are not looking for the applause of man. Hey, what a great job you're doing. We're looking for God's applause, and we won't hear it this side of heaven. So your motive and my motive, if we're going to be an uncontainable church, is we've got to stay in the zone, and this is the zone. In 1988, the United States in Seoul, South Korea... <clears throat> had the Olympics, and the sprint relay team that we had was going to win it all. You'll remember this. 1988, and Carl Lewis from Houston, Texas, who actually worked at, uh, went into the salon several times that Leslie worked at as, as a cosmetologist, and uh, he was the fastest human being there ever was in, in 1980. He was fast. He could blaze. He could blaze. And so the coach thought, you know what, I've got a plan, and here's my plan. Instead of running our sprint relay A team in the semifinals, I'm going to run the B team. And so they ran the B team. And guess what happened to the United States in 1988? They never got to the finals. Because the B team had Calvin Smith. Calvin Smith could not hand off I think his last name was McNeil, could not hand the baton off to, the, to McNeil, and, and they had a botched exchange somewhere. And so the United States team, who had the fastest man in the world, who had the fastest team in the world, was disqualified because when you run the sprint relay, there's a zone that you have to hand the baton off. There's a zone. And they fumbled, and they, they didn't drop the baton, but they missed the zone. They couldn't get the handoff. So Calvin Smith, and it was Larry McNeil, they, they just couldn't get it. And when they finally got it, they were outside the zone. What a tragedy to have the fastest person on your team. And to not even drop the baton on the relay, but to disqualify yourself because you didn't stay in the zone. Paul says, here's a zone for every minister of the gospel and you need to stay in it. My prayer for this church, for me, for anybody who's a minister, which is all of us, that we'll stay in the zone. Some of you need to get out of the zone that you're in and you need to get in this zone that Paul's talking about because a gospel minister, look at it, they suffer they're bold. Verse 3, they exhort. They live pure lives, verse 3. Verse 4, they're approved by God. Verse 4, they are trusted with the gospel. Verse 5, they could give a rip whether men think anything of them. They care what God thinks. And verse 6 says, they make no demands and put a burden on anybody. They will fulfill their calling. They will stay in the zone. I want to ask you something this morning. Are you in the zone that Paul's talking about? Are you in the zone? Because if you're not, all you have to do is bow before Jesus and trust him for this very life, for this very message, for this very ministry, for this very mandate. You can say, Lord Jesus Christ, I have been out of the zone I've been handing it off over here when effective gospel delivery is right here in the first six verses. And Lord, from this day on, I'm going to live a clean life and a pure life, not because I'm going to try harder. I'm going to trust more. 
I'm going to trust your life more. I'm going to trust you to be the purity in my life. I'm going to trust you to be the conduit through which everything flows. I am not going to move anymore in my life on what I want to do. And I, for goodness sakes, am not going to seek the applause of men because men have disappointed me. They haven't clapped loud enough for me. They haven't made me feel good. And I'm telling you, that's a good thing if men had made you feel good because you don't get your significance from man. You get your significance from God. That's where you get your significance. You get your significance from God. So let's be effective bread men at First Baptist Alcoa. Would you pray with me? If you're here this morning and you've never become a minister because you don't know Jesus as your Savior, Paul would say to you, my message for you today is, the gospel is good news. It's the good news that Jesus paid it all. If you're here this morning, you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. He loves you. He wants to put the baton in your hand in the zone that He has planned out for your life. And He wants you to carry it for His glory and for His good. And I pray today that if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus, that you will just do, you'll say, Lord Jesus, I, I surrender. We sang a song earlier today that says, I surrender. I surrender all. I surrender my will, my way, everything to you, Lord. That's what salvation is. It's opening up your hands and receiving a gift. Man can't put a gift in your hand. God can put a gift in your hand. And the gift is salvation. So if you'd like to trust Jesus as your Savior today, I'm going to lead you through the prayer right now. This is, this is what you do. If this is your heart motive, if this is your heart cry to God, it's so simple you can miss how easy it is. You just open up your heart and you say, Lord Jesus Christ, I receive you as my Savior. I repent and turn from my sin. And I trust you to become a the Lord of my life. That's all you have to do. And then He changes your motivation. He changes your heart cry. The things you used to go after, you don't go after anymore. Because there's a new nature, a new heart, a new life in you. Old things are passed away. So if you need to do that, settle that first. And then if you say, you know, Freeman, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know I'm saved. I know I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. But I'm not in the zone. And I know I'm not in the zone. In fact, I don't even know what the zone is. Paul says, I just put a zone together for you in chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. And everybody who's a minister at this church, which is everybody who's saved by the blood of Jesus, we've got to operate in the zone. There's got to be cleanness. There's got to be purity. There's got to be a right motive. There can't be a cloak of covetousness. There can't be a desire to get and gain and go. There's got to be a desire to get men and women to the point of trusting Jesus as Savior. And that's what we're doing. But we're doing it through you. So this invitation is however the Word of God applies in your life. And it's going to be different for all of us. We're going to stand and sing, Love Ran Red at the cross. And may this be more than words for you. We're going to pray. I'll be at the front singing with you, asking God to speak to me. If you've trusted Christ, just come, come to me and say, hey, I, I need to trust Christ or I have trusted Christ. If you want to pray, you can pray. But we're one big choir and we're one big family together. Father, do what you want to do in this invitation in the lives of people who need a touch from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand where you are? You sing as God leads. You do what He wants you to do. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of
I surrender.